Hi, I'm Adam Spencer and welcome to Day One, the podcast that spotlights Australian startups, founders, and the organizations that empower Australian entrepreneurship. We go back to the beginning to tell the story of Australia's most inspiring founders and how they built their companies. You're listening to a special interview series as part of a documentary W2D1 is producing about the history of the Australian startup ecosystem. On the episode today, we have John Allsopper, web developer, author, and conference organizer who's been working in Australia's startup ecosystem since the 90s. In 1994, John co-founded WestCiv, a company which creates tools and training for web designers and developers. WestCiv was one of the earliest companies to adopt the internet as a distribution channel for software. John also co-founded Web Directions, a conference for web designers, developers, and digital creatives. Cameron Adams Mm -hmm. said you would be a great person to interview for this documentary. How do you know Cameron Adams? Do you know him? I know Cameron extremely well. I I kind of feel partly responsible for him meeting his wife. (laughs) So, which is a very good thing, right? And they're both very good friends of mine. So I can't, it's lost in the midst of time, but it is to do with web directions. And and Cameron spoke early and often at our conferences. Right. And he also did for two or three years at least these amazing experimental opening sequences so like opening titles, but far more elaborate than that for, for the conference, yeah. for our major conference, uh, just sort of showcasing what web browsers could do, like re- really amazing. Because, you know, he's an incredible creative technologist. I mean, I mean he's obviously well known in the world of uh, the world of Canva now, whatever, but really where he, you know, where he gained prominence and probably I suspect why the folks at the, the other founders at Canva approached him is he just, he just has this extraordinary way of turning, you know, integrating technology and design and creating amazing things. Did you mention the date that Cameron did those presentations? So I reckon I could dig it up for you, but I reckon they were probably, so one of them was when he was doing Google Wave, but I reckon they're probably like 2008, 9, 10 or 10, right. 11, 12, that sort of time frame. Yeah. It's an interesting circle that happened here. So I know Maxine Sharon. I met her yes. a few years back. So Maxine and I were both, we found a web direction together, but many, many years ago we were life partners. Um, and, and so we, we actually started our software company together in the early 90s. I did not know that. There you go. So <laughs> there was sprung that one on you. Uh, we're still very, very good friends and very close. Uh, and we, we kind of continue to run the software and, the, and then the conference company together long after we were no longer together. But um, it was a very small world back then. Trust me. <laughs> I can still, tell you. It still feels other. that way now. <laughs> ah, yeah. Up. Well, I'm too old to try. Like, it's, the number of people is way too big for me to keep track of. But back then, you, you kind of could get them all together in a room, which is sort of what Web Directions was. It was kind of the room where people who were in the web got together and went, oh, I know you. Or, wow, there's other people doing stuff I do. Right? That's a great segue for us to go back. Do you want to take us back to whatever time you think is most relevant to start this story of your involvement in this space? Yeah, so very briefly... I uh, was kind of a real nerd at school and personal computers were starting to be a thing like pre IBM PC, pre Apple Mac. We're talking kind of Apple II. We had a bunch of them at school uh, and also knew like, you know, friends of like parents of my friends who I always way geekier than my friends, right? And they were getting into like, like accountants and doctors and people like that. They were the people getting into sort of we used to call them microcomputers, right? So we're talking the kind of very early 1980s. And there'd be all these little meetups, what we call meetups now, right? Where people go to go and they'd swap software on floppy disks and they'd show <laughs> off their, their... And it was all... Because there was no business in it, right? Like there's no, no one thought there was going to be a huge business there. They were all total nerds. And they were literally dentists and doctors and accountants. People could afford, you know, like a $2,000 computer, which was about somewhere between a fifth and a tenth of a price in in a Western Sydney for a house, right? Oh, seriously, like, you know, you know, I, th- I, I looked it up once. I think in the early 80s, you, you know, in McDonald Town, Newtown, part of Sydney, you could buy a house for maybe $20,000. And these were like two or $3,000 computers, right? Wow. So, so by today's standards, it's like $100,000, right, in some respects. I mean, they didn't seem like that much money. 
So that's sort of the very earliest inklings I had. And then I studied uh, in a roundabout way. It was really interesting. Back then, the hardware and software weren't things you sort of separated out. Like if you're interested in computing, you kind of had to be interested in hardware as much as software. Often when you were bu- building and that meant just putting together like motherboards. It was like building computers. So I sort of studied um, originally electrical engineering and ended up doing computer science at, at university, Sydney University when... You know, there weren't many people doing that. It was the kind of mid eighties. Yeah. Yeah. So that's and then I kind of took a little hiatus and the way and I was really interested in hypertext because I had these interests in the arts and, and, and a whole bunch of stuff. I studied law and I really thought about how could computing help you study law. And I got really interested in hypertext as a concept and we, and we started working on a hype well, built and sold uh, in the early nineties, a hypertext knowledge management system inspired by my study of law on the Mac, and that was my first foray, and, and I kind of got into the web because, well, back then, the way you sold software was to do, if you're really lucky, a publishing deal, a bit like the music industry, and as we all know, because of Taylor Swift, it's not a great deal for creatives, right? So you get like 5% of, 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 of whatever revenues, someone else completely controlled every aspect of the, of the business. So we, Maxine and I, because we worked on that together, what we thought about was, well, this web thing started, maybe we could use the web as a way of distributing our software, selling our software. And in 1995, we'd started doing that. And we and I went to this conference and there was this Apple executive. And, and you know, there was about 20 or 30 people doing software export from Australia. And this Apple executive, I remember having a chat with him over a beer. He's, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm doing this. And we said, he said, no one will ever buy software over the internet. <laughs> It's kind of, he really said that, by the way. He genuinely said that. Uh, you know, it's like a bit of the famous, you know, no one will ever need more than 640 K RAM or, you know, no, there would never be a market for more than five computers. But this guy actually said that to me. And he was he was wrong, it turns out. <laughs> so that's sort of so I sort of got into the web, you know, in the early 93, 94, because I wanted to use it what well, we were using it as a way to distribute our software. And 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 at the time, like most computer people, the web we kind of looked down on, because it's like there was a whole world of hypertext. People were doing a lot of research on it. And and what the web offered was really was really primitive and, and really underpowered compared to what we consider the state of the art of hypertext would be. But, you know, it sort of slowly won me over. And along the way, you know, like especially back then, people working trying to create a software business, I taught a bit of TAFE, taught some web stuff. And just sort of slowly won me over until I, I kind of dawned on me that no, no, somehow this is something really different because you know back then a computer was a thing that sat alone if you wanted to transfer information to and from it you used a floppy disk you know there was really no network unless you're in an you know, enterprise or a university or something there was no networking no one connected and the web sort of kind of turned something about the networked nature of all these devices and really and obviously that had happened before but the web kind of made it doable for you know most people so what I recognized then is the mid nineties was there was a, like, it was hard, getting harder to develop for the web, particularly because a lot of the people who were, who were developing for the web were software engineers, weren't people from computing backgrounds. They were people from, you know, desktop publishing and, and animation and these other areas. So I started working on developer tools and lots of training. We did these online courses for people. I, I have this great course. So I generally about five, 10, 15 years ahead of what everyone else does when they finally make all their money. <laughs> And by then I've got bored and moved on, right? So, so sort of, you know, we had this period, Maxine and I had the, we had the software, we were building courses, people would take them online. And it was almost like backwards. We, we started doing in-person workshops and started doing them right around 2000, like right around the dot-com bomb, the first, first dot-com crash. Yeah. And, and that was the first time almost literally I'd met anyone who did what I did. I mean, new people online. I went to New York and met a couple of people there, but I, I basically didn't know anyone in Australia. There were no meetups. There were no. There was none of that stuff, right? So if you knew someone, you knew them kind of online. And then um, there was a thing called the Web Standards Group. That a couple of folks there it was um, Peter Furminger and Russell Wait, uh, Weekly. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Russ, um, who I still know quite well, particularly Russ. And they started this web standards group, which is very much about people using CSS and HTML and core web technologies. And I went and spoke in, I think it was the end of 2001, at their kind of big Christmas end of year celebration where there were like 24 people, including the organizers and me. But this was a big meetup, right? 
So we sort of started talking. We thought, well, you know, I think the, what Australia needs is a conference, right? Because 24 people came to this free meetup. So clearly we needed a conference. So it sort of became the germ of something you developed over the next year or so. And the following year, um, t- 2004, we did the first kind of web design and development conference in Sydney. And, you know, there were a few around the world, none of which exist still. I can't, I don't think there was ever anything like that in Australia. And we had a whole, we had a couple of hundred people turn up, including, I mean, one thing I always remember was one of the founders of Campaign Monitor, which have they come up on your your radar? Have you spoken to either of those? I haven't spoken to them yet, but I'm yeah. trying to. Yeah. Yeah. So they like if people, you know, young folks don't know, they were one of the first really early success stories of of kind of Australian kind of web startup world. And this is before they even were. They were they were they were an agency that had built this software to do email marketing. And I remember one of the founders coming up to me. He said, "Oh, this is so great. There's all these people doing stuff like us." And I'm like, "Wow." He said, "Oh, I'm, we're looking." to hire someone right so and i thought wow this is real people will have real jobs in this industry now and i remember a few years later joking so i just should have just taken a job with him (laughs) instead of of trying to bang the head against the wall and do the conferences for the last 20 or nearly 20 years so so that kind of leads us to how we more or less started the conferences in australia and you know as i said it was sort of a place where a whole bunch of people who've been doing web-related stuff got together and realized and they can meet people doing what they did because back then probably even the biggest organizations might have maybe one or two people doing web stuff and even if they were like abc abc were quite big in that but the way abc works was they have individual web people working they didn't have like a central web team you work in sport or news or you know whatever area so so even in large organizations you probably worked with very few if any people i mean fairfax were really early trailblazers, not just in Australia, but globally, doing a lot of really cool and interesting stuff. Yeah, so so I guess that's that was the sort of origins of what we've continued to do for the last 16, 17 years. So 2004, 2006, when you started the conference, that's still about a decade before kind of the community, really, the startup community really started to get going. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yep, yep. And a lot of people have said that Really early on, it was just a case of these little tiny little communities of people catching up at coffee shops or bars, and and they were very much that crowd that you're talking about the the web people, um, the you know the programmers, the coders that that was the community. Absolutely. So I'm glad you brought that up. But can you speak to that a little bit more? I don't know, just your involvement in that. Yeah. So so remember probably the very very first thing I did <laughs> in person. I ran these in person workshops where because i had these online conferences and and there was a, a, a chap down in melbourne who, who, who teaches photography and he said oh if i got a bunch of people together in melbourne to do a workshop would you come down and do it for us right and this would have been i think 2003 and i i said sure that's super exciting right so because uh, you know even like funny thing is people didn't fly around to do stuff right virgin was pretty new you know even just flying to melbourne to run a workshop was like it seemed super exciting to me, right? I'm going to be way off here probably with this guest. Yeah. But that, was that Darren Rouse? No, no. he's Because um, he, he's, he's the only Melbourne photographer guy I know. No, it'll come to me now. It'll come. I think his surname was Murdoch. Uh, Stu, Stu Murdoch, I think it was. I'll look it up. I feel really bad because I really, I sort of feel like I owe enormous amount to him because he sort of catalyzed because he, he'd sort of seen the online stuff and he said, would you do it in person? And so I kind of took the online courses and put them together as a one day workshop, went down there and there were about half a dozen people and that was done at the TAFE he was teaching at. Yeah. Um, I think it's safe enough to say that now. I think we snuck in on the weekend to do it. <laughs> um, and and I, so I had done that once. So I, I did it in Sydney and, and that was sort of, out, uh, that, that's, that I kind of had half a dozen people, or maybe a few more, like a 14, 15 people did that. And one of those is someone who is now, the was one of the founders of Build Kite, Tim Lucas. So um, Tim, who kind of, in a sense, um, interned with us, he did a little bit of stuff with us around that time because that. So what? So what I did was I. He, I, I there were two or three people. There were a couple of people at that workshop who lived around Bondi, and I lived at Bondi at the time. So I said, "Oh, well, anyway, but so we put this word out, and a half a dozen people: Peter Ottery, who was at Whistle Out, amazing designer, who was at Fairfax at the time, Tim, and a couple of people. Kind of, we all had a beer at the Beach Road Hotel in Bondi when it wasn't what it is now." So it was a very different world, um, 2003. And, and, and that was sort of what it was. It was like people knew, oh, let's get a coffee, let's have a beer. And then the Web Standards Group, um, and, uh, which was definitely, I think, the only thing 
kind of like that that I knew of. That was sort of how it worked until, and like, I, you know, I, I would like to to think without being too conceited that Web Directions really did bring together people at a scale that hadn't been, and not just from Sydney, people were coming from Melbourne and, and, and you know, even Perth. It was like people coming from all over Australia, uh, maybe even a couple from New Zealand, because, you know, if you did this stuff, there just wasn't anything else like it. Mm. Why, why a conference? I know, it's almost like counterintuitive, right? I was doing all this online stuff. Why would, you know, I, I, I don't know, even then, I think the instinct was, and maybe especially because I taught at TAFE in person, because I'd given these workshops in person. I mean, I've, I've, I've always felt there's a tremendous power in humans together in a room, right? And I think, you know, by connecting people together, you know, it's short-circuiting a lot of the things that can take. And, and back then, you know, there was no Twitter, there was no Flickr, there was no, there was nothing, there was no Facebook. There's no way really for people to create online community. I mean, I can't, there, were, there was some, so probably the, the chief thing was things called news groups, which were, but they were very, very kind of structured and focused on the topic and conversation. Um, so, you know, I think, I think there was even more need for that in person back then um, when there was just nothing social online really to speak of. Is there a point in time where you, this web community, this web-based community, and then you've got the startup slash tech. Mm. I see those as two different things. They're very similar to different mm. groups. Mm. Is, was there a time where you started to see that other group emerge out of the your community? Yeah, look, it's, it's a really, I think... I think where it's more obvious in a way is in the US, right? So so you sort of have people, I was having a conversation with someone in the web world, very, very well known uh, that I know about. So there's people of the web, right? I guess they're very much like, for them, the web is a medium in the same way the television, radio, cinema, whatever. It's a kind of, you know, it, it's a kind of media to be explored, a way of communicating to be explored, right? And in the US, that largely focuses, you know, not exclusively, but but on the northeast, which is where traditional publishing was, right? You know, New York, Boston, that you know. So you'll find a lot of people who are of of that kind are very much based in the northeast, and then you have the people who are like you know. I guess it's the startup world, it's the Silicon Valley world, whatever you, the product world, whatever you want to call, it. and and it tends to be more Silicon Valley based, and the web is a means to an end. Like it, it, it's a delivery mechanism rather than the web being the end in itself, like the medium to explore. And, and I suspect for the most part, like the people who first gravitated to our conferences, um, they were of that latter kind. And, and partly because in Australia, there were, there, you know, as I'm sure many of the people you've interviewed will, will have said, there, there, there just wasn't the same kind of community. Certainly, like but probably our third or fourth conference, fourth conference, we decided we'd do a day for startups where we would focus on the things you need to know as a startup, like, you know, around intellectual property. Because we, we talked to all these people, some of them are really well known now, and they had no idea about IP. And they'd be doing some stuff that well, was probably legally problematic or at least, you know, opening up to the possibility that someone doesn't like what they're doing and just shuts down their entire business, right? And so legals and finance, we thought, we'll put together this thing, which is sort of like a boot camp. We called it that. I think it was the startup boot camp, right? And you were going to get these insights from lawyers and accountants and, you know, all those sorts of people about how to do startup right. And we had like two people sign up for it, right? So <laughs> we just cancelled it because there wasn't a demand, at least in our industry, mm. for something like that. Mm. Right, and this is years before Startcon and and some of these other things. It wasn't really on most people's radar. So I guess you know I could dig out the details, but there can't have been any earlier than two thousand six. It could have been in two thousand seven. You know, and I don't think it just spoke to the fact that our world wasn't like that because a lot of people in our world, like for example, Mike Cannon Brooks spoke at our set in two thousand six, right? And they were that was their first year. So it's not like we didn't have people in our world that, and you know, like as we talked a bit about Ken Adams, so they've had spoke numerous times at our conferences, right? So it wasn't like people who didn't either were in or didn't end up in that world weren't in ours. I, I think I think it came much later in a lot of ways. And and because I think a lot of people went to Silicon Valley. I, people well, you know, in, in you know, in the 
either side of 2010 were going off to White Combinator. They're going off to Silicon Valley, right? Um, that was very much a thing, uh, either to work or start their companies. I do want to talk about that later period in a second. Hmm. 2006 is when it says Web Directions was kind of started. Yeah, so we did, we did two... 2004, 2005 with Russ and Pete, yeah. and then 2006 onwards, Maxine and I. Right. So we sort of, the original one was called Web Essentials, and after a couple of years, complicated stuff, whatever, the history, Maxine and I continued. We sort of like right. took it in a slightly different direction, but, um, you know, very much based on, you know, the foundations of Web Essentials. Right. Okay. What What can you tell me about that first year, the 2006 yeah. year of running the festival? Like how, how the conference, sorry, how... What was that like? Yeah, so so we um, it was the la- last year we did it at UTS. So we did we did t- two thousand four five and then six. So four five was a relatively small place at U- UTS, and then we two thousand six we went to quite a big. I think we had like three hundred fifty people. We built a Wi Fi network because there wasn't one at the university. You know, and you think about oh wow, it's like well you know the average laptop probably like pro- like Max would have come with Wi Fi cards. The average uh, laptop didn't. There was no iPhone. There were no smartphones to speak of. But we went and built a Wi-Fi network where we had to do wireless backhaul. We had a which would have cost us like unbelievable amount of money. But I think we had a sponsor who were who were like air hosts, whatever. They probably don't exist now. But they we and but we had to buy. So we bought a whole a bunch of like radio routers to put around the, the auditorium, and then we plugged them in back and did all this backhaul. Just to give people a sense of like how primitive some of this stuff was, right? It's the first time we had two tracks, you know, because what's really important to think, and this is a bit more on the geeky end, but you know, these days you have like such specialization, product roles, design roles, engineering roles, back end roles, front end roles. Uh-uh. You did everything, right? Like you you had to do everything. We didn't have like you just you were probably called a web developer, maybe called a web designer, and you, you kind of did everything. You know, you did the back end, you did the front end, you did. We're not product people, right? Um, there were there were simpler times, but but so our content was very much you know there was you know. But this year we had a first split track. We sort of had more designy, producty. No, I don't think we really used the term product in two thousand and six, but we had more design product stuff, and then we had more the engineering stuff in in the other. Right, so so we were starting to see a little bit of specialization, but it was still very much, you know, I think I remember even two or three years later, we were we had a conference in Canada and we had one of the big famous you know, UX people saying, well, the, our research shows that the average the average um, e-commerce team is four people, right? That was it, like you know, that that, that was like the whole team was on average four people. And that was like, oh my goodness, what a big team, four people. <laughs> you know, they, what do they all do? <laughs> you know? So these days you have button engineers. <laughs> but back then you did everything. You plugged in the Wi-Fi, right? You just, you seriously, you ran the servers in a cage in your rooms, you know, the whole business. So, you know, obviously, you know, it was very interesting to try and program conferences like that. And some it's easier because you pretty much did something on everything. But, you know, I think that was probably what was starting to happen. And and I think, you know, as I said, Mike Cannonbrooks came and spoke. Um, I think it was the only time the two founders of Campaign Monitor agreed to ever speak on stage, which I think Maxine, who, you know, is, is kind of magical power with people. And somehow you got she got them to come and speak. So we had, like, the founders of Campaign Monitor. We had the founders of one of the founders of Atlassian. Wow. Um, we had a uh, person who's now the head of product at Zip. Uh, she's who's still a very good friend of mine. You know, so some really people who've kind of continued to really impact. You know, Cam, Cam spoke actually. I think that might have famously been when he met his wife. Wow. They'll, they'll correct me on that, but I have a feeling it was that year because um, Lisa was um, the what a stage manager. So I mean, like, it was a, it was like, it was like the Woodstock. It was like the Woodstock in the Australian web industry. That yes. is a great line. There you go. That's going. Going, that's, go, that's, that's going in the documentary. There you go. Well, you know, look, I, it seems so long ago. And it seems so, like, in some way it is so long ago. I mean, I've got four kids now and none of them were born back then. Um, well, 2005 is my oldest. But, they, you know, it was it was a time when, you know, like I think Australia, the Australian industry was emerging. And, you know, it, things were becoming real jobs that people actually got paid for. Whereas you go back much before 2000 or even into the 2000s and, There'd probably be fewer than 100 people in 2001 being paid as a job in Australia to do web stuff.
stuff. Might be slightly exaggerating, but but I, I think I have the right order of magnitude there, right? So, so this was a time you could sort of sense something was really starting to happen. Can you comment on, so you started the conference 2006 or, you know, 2004, 2006. Yeah. How quickly did you see the community grow? Yeah, so 2006 and then seven, was, so the, the UTS tiles were too big, we had to go away. So we went to the convention centre in Sydney and really stepped up again to like 500 or so people who came and we started adding multiple tracks. I think we were doing three tracks. So we used that similar model then till about 2013 at the convention centre. You know, we, we have a design track, engineering track. So what became a sort of product track? as well so it was certainly a, I, I think i think what you were seeing was like this growth before there was this real splintering of, of the industry perhaps you know 2013 14 you know where you know probably with with this the real start of the rise of, of, of kind of startups in australia and, and, and a proper startup ecosystem before that you know, they, they, you know, they, we always used to joke about it. everyone called themselves a VC, but no, literally no one, none of the VC funds in Australia actually had any money, right? So I never invested in anything. So I mean, I'm not kidding. I mean, like well into the 20 teens, we will talk about being there was almost no VC in Australia. You know, there was still very much this model, and I so we used to run conferences in North America and Europe and Japan as well. So I was, you know, spending a lot of time in North North America, a lot of time in Silicon Valley, and 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 talking often to product people who would you know founders and so on and say you know that you know you were required to come and be in silicon valley if you so you got invested you bring a whole team from atlanta you bring a whole team from, you know it was sort of this expectation i think that's one of the challenges in the early days the australian industry faced was the expectation was well you know if we're going to invest in you you're going to come to silicon valley right and and that was probably a very big ask for a lot of australian companies right yeah so i think this is sort of the time when that was starting to happen from a, an operational standpoint, like, you know, yourself and Maxine running this conference and, and growing it, how steep was the learning curve? Because, you know, today, I'm just reading this off your website, 12 cities, 13 years, 67 events, 600 plus speakers and 10,000 plus attendees, you know. You're... And that's probably quite a bit bigger since we wrote that one. Right. And of course, now we've gone online. Well, that's, that's, that's really interesting, though. The difference between these tens of thousands of attendees and we're right now talking about 2006, 500 people. Sure. Yeah, I'm just, A, the operational side, like how steep was that learning curve for you? Like how did you how did you pull this off? Well, it was very organic and incremental, I think. I think we acquired capabilities as we went. And, and I think, you know, it was, it's always, it's, it's sort of been this challenge and somewhat frustration for us in, you know, in a world of massive rapid growth that we, and this changed a bit in the last couple of years, ironically, but, but with physical events, right? You, so, that, so we're in Australia where, in the scheme of things, it's a tiny market, right? The, 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 you know, the size of the developer designer market in Australia is tiny compared to Europe, or North America and elsewhere, right? How do you grow a business like this? So it's very different, ironically, again, to the sort of businesses that would attend our conferences. Yeah. You know, um, for them, growth was going global. Growth was, you know, that sort of massive total addressable markets. And, you know, our total addressable market was tiny, right? So we probably have a non-trivial percentage of the entire TAM in Australia of developers and designers, but it's not actually a super great business, right? So what our strategy... So, so essentially, I guess we, we kind of... You know, we'd run in-person work, we, workshops for 15 people and worked out how to do some of that. We ran a conference a couple of years for 200 people. It became 350, it became 500, it became 600, right? And then, you know, we sort of reached this sort of relative ma local maxima, at least. So we sort of started doing some more focused events in Melbourne around engineering and design. And we, we picked up a partner in Japan and we started running some conference in Japan. We, we, we had a couple of partners in Canada. We ran a couple of years there and then we took that to North America and, and then we acquired a conference from someone we knew who was leading the industry in the UK. So it's sort of our, our biggest. We probably did Japan and Sydney and, and Melbourne and US and it was just all a bit ridiculous really because because the costs increase kind of linearly marketing is very focused and 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 local I guess ironically we've, our business is very different at least until the last couple of years from most of the people who've come to our conferences right um certainly most startups right yeah 
so I imagine going on, you know, you keep saying the last couple of years has mm-hmm. changed and that's, that's going, the going online part. Yeah, so look, my, my, I mean, we, we've been exploring online stuff around conferences for years. So, so once streaming became in any way feasible, so at first, time, like I think in 2012, we really explored the idea of streaming to, say, a non Australian audience, our developer conference in Melbourne. Mm. So you immediately th- run into some issues, which is, well, it's the middle of the night, most of the world, right? Yeah. So we've got, you know, Southeast Asia and whatever, and, you know, but they're generally, and they're good large markets in some respects, but they're generally, you know, the average income's generally lower and so on. So we explored that. And we finally, you know, we, we did a lot of work exploring how we might do that, and we never really did it. But in the meantime, we had been videoing and producing high quality versions of our presentations since 2012 right so we built up this on ever-growing archive of you know hundreds and hundreds of these presentations some of which literally introduced the world to groundbreaking ideas right progressive web apps launched at one of our conferences right just by way of example so we've been long thinking well what do we what do we do with these because people like people at conferences take video and just put them in youtube and then like well no one benefits really I mean, the conference has spent a lot of money, and let me tell you, we've done this, and we've got some videos with hundreds of thousands of views, and collectively millions of views, probably, and no discernible marketing benefit for us. Plus, you know, how does the speaker benefit? Well, you know, like at the end of the day, they're not monetizing their IP. Like, so, you know, we, we just felt there was there was value that was just not being properly recognized. So we've been working a long time on how we can do that. And and so about three years ago, we sort of softly launched and we've been organically building, again, essentially a platform for conference videos. I guess, you know, in one of a better word, Netflix for conference videos. And most of them are ours, but then all from us, we've, we've got a few partner conferences that people we know and like, and they're on that platform as well. So, so we'd sort of been building out a lot of ideas about what online stuff should look like. And then COVID hit, and we essentially didn't have a business anymore. But I think because we'd invested a lot in building that technology and more importantly, thinking about what that could be like, we were able to move that those our conferences online, right? And... I'd like to think we did in a way, well, firstly, it's been really successful. We now have 40% plus of our audience outside Australia, you know, up from close to zero at the beginning of last year. We've grown to six specialized conferences across the year. Uh, So we thought really deeply about what you should be doing online, that if you were doing a conference online from scratch, what should it look like? And you see most conferences are still just taking their two-day, eight-hour-a-day conference, slapping online, it's all live, you know, the quality is like this, you know. And, and what we thought is, no, 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 we, all of this, we got to rethink all of this. So we pre-record everything, we really produce it well, we do great transcripts, we do a whole bunch of stuff around accessibility. We make the day shorter, right? So we're not expecting people to be eight hours a day. We make them three to four hours. Once it's three to four hours, you can run it as pre-recorded. You can do it three or four times and cover the whole world in a day. We don't do them multiple days. We do two days over two weeks, right? So you can create a whole different kind of event if you think what is native when you go online. So so that's where we've got to. Um, You know, bringing a a ton of our, what we've learned from running conferences, you know, it's sort of all come together here. Now, we actually, we're about to announce that we're we're going to do one in-person conference next year. We're going to do our big end of year summit. But the rest is all going to be online. It's gone really well, and I genuinely think that it delivers enormous value for everyone. And yes, you don't have the people meeting in person, which is an important part of conferences, but not the only part of it, right? So, you know, it's been an interesting journey. You know, hopefully it's every step has sort of been informed by what we've done before. So going back to your question that prompted this long diatribe, you know, I think it's very much about organically, you know, learning and and, and each step of the way. If you go back to look at me teaching at TAFE in the 90s, right, like in a way there's a through line here because, you know, it's about education and professional development and how that works. And that, ironically, the in-person at TAFE became the online which became back to the in-person, and now we've gone online again, right? So this is sort of cycles, but hopefully each of those cycles, we've learned what to do, learned what can be improved, learned what we shouldn't be doing. Yeah.
before I ask you, there's this last question that I ask every single person. Mm -hmm. But before we get to that, how much has your audience, uh, the conference audience changed, you know, since it first began to now when, you know, this startup community is technology community has really grown quite a bit Mm -hmm. um, the last, you know, five, six, seven years. Has that changed your audience? Yeah, so I think I think at the macro level, when we started, it was about a community, right? It's literally like people were there probably getting paid less than they could be paid elsewhere in many cases. They, they were driven by interest and a passion, a bit like those kind of accountants and dentists and doctors I talked about in the early 80s. Right? The driver for them was not, this is a great career, this is a great business, because it wasn't, right? It was interesting. There was an intuition people had there's something new and interesting here. So that and, and that is actually a community, right? And I think we we spoke to that, and 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 that was that motivated us and, and drove what we did. I think now I would describe it as, as as an industry, right? And and as a group of professionals. And this is not a discouragement, a disparagement. It's not a criticism. It's just an observe a transition that's occurred, right? Where, um, you know, uh, you know, people often. It's, it's what they, you know, no, no one studied web design at university in 2000, right? Like the, the career pathways were very eclectic and people coming in from all different angles, usually not out. I was unusual in someone that had a computer science background in the web, at least in, a, you know, in Australian people I mixed with in the late 90s, early 2000s, right? So it, I, think, I think what's happened is we've become an industry and a profession. And I think along the way, the sort of events we've run have initially probably instinctively but increasingly more kind of consciously adapted on the basis of that right it's less about that meeting someone like you because you're the only person you you know in your workplace and you probably barely have ever spoken to someone who does what you do that's just not the case for most people anymore that's not the job that they need a conference for Right, they need it to be. You know, we continue to be this incredibly fast moving. It doesn't matter if you're in product design, engineering, you know, whatever area you're in, it's incredibly fast moving. So how you keep up, and and we're very much about. Well, that's our job, right? Our job is to help you keep up with developments in the field, right? And and so I guess you know the audience has changed because we still have a lot of people who came right at the beginning are still coming, right? All the people they run, run, you know, or they're right at the top of the organisation, but people in their organisation come, right? But I think. How I characterize them now is they're not members of a community, they're professionals. And, you know, we're not a community, we're an industry. And, you know, that's inevitable. And you, do I miss the, the early days of what the web was like? Absolutely. Although it might be a bit more nostalgia than anything else, because maybe at the time we certainly didn't think it was super awesome to be not earning a lot of money and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, now it's definitely a profession, definitely an industry, and that's definitely what we kind of cater to with our events last question Mm. keeping in mind that i'm trying to what you know what we're doing here this interview is going to be part of a documentary about the history of the australian startup ecosystem Mm -hmm. i I want people from all corners of the ecosystem to listen to this story so founders investors policymakers academics do you have a message do you have something that you want to tell everybody that's listening yeah so I, i have long thought about this and you know, having seen this very in the scheme of things long transition what i felt what i felt for a long time it frustrated me a great deal and and i saw it in people in the industry i saw it in, certainly in policy makers and elsewhere well and, and look it's not unique to australia by any means right you know i think that the best way of putting it is that you you know how many times we have put silicon x right including Silicon Roundabout, Silicon Beach, Silicon, you know, Silicon Alley. I mean, they even do it in New York, right? But, but I, think, I think the challenge continues to be seeing that there's a single model of development in a, in, in a startup ecosystem. It's got to look like Silicon Valley. You know, it's got... And, and, and you know, I think a lot of the time we, we kind of ape those you know, rituals, right? They're like rituals you perform. You have a VC, you have C, you have, you know, uh, you know and, and I think a lot of time it's founders and entrepreneurs and people, like we're kind of a bit obsessed with the trappings of that rather than going, I think, thinking about what is unique. So Silicon Valley is unique, right? 
It's a unique circumstance. And, if, and I think everyone who wants to talk about it should think about the history of Silicon Valley, where it comes from. You know, And I think Fred Wilson wrote this marvellous piece that was very critical of the new... And he's a VC in New York, and, um, and, and, and he was very critical of what I'm talking about in New York, of all places, which is probably the second, if not the third, kind of most vibrant startup ecosystem in the world. And he, he talked about how what's unique about Silicon Valley is it's had probably seven or eight kind of generations of, of startup leading to success, leading to spawning, you know, dozens if not hundreds of, of, of people with real money and the experience of being involved in fast startups, right? Australia's had what? We've had a handful of really world-class successes, and it's not, again, not disparaging, not criticism, right? And hopefully we'll have many more. And I, I think a lot of the time, rather than thinking about what is unique and special about Australia, Right? What do, what do we have here that we can really take advantage of? And so, so for the longest time, I think things like um, areas, you know, I think one reason why financial technology and fintech has done quite well in Australia, relatively speaking, mm. is because we do have a really strong financial services sector, mm. right? That 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 is world class. It has a lot of issues and challenges, probably in no small part due to its success. Right? So so to me, it seems that rather than this scattergun approach, really identifying what does Australia have some kind of relative strength in. So one area we do super well in is in the whole developer, developer tools, developer, you know, even like whether it's Atlassian, whether it's BuildKite, there's a whole bunch of successes in that area, right? And I think that's an accident, right? Because you get these virtuous cycles of, of, of kind of interrelationships between startups and, and, and their market. And I think a similar one's around education. I, th- I think the last couple of years should have shown us that online-based education is a shit show, right? And I speak as someone who has four kids under 16, and one of whom I was eight, and I worked really closely with, particularly in the lockdown in Sydney for three months. And, it, you know, we were using products from the biggest names in technology, and they were fucked, Right? I think there's this huge opportunity in specific areas, and I think Australia in the education sector has huge advantages. Right, We have a really healthy, well-structured, edu- despite everything that's happened the last couple of years, well-structured education system. You know, It's really incredibly interestingly regulated, and I think there are real opportunities there. So I think, I think we're, you know, from the perspective maybe of the bigger picture, I, I think you know, what we really should be thinking about is is where do we excel? And then whether you're a policymaker, whether you're a government, whatever you are, that you whether you're an investor, think about what are those two or three sectors we do super well, right? And let's really put all the wood behind that, those arrows rather than try and, you know, think we're a mini Silicon Valley and just, you know, fund everything that comes up above the parapet and see what works. I, I don't think we have that luxury of doing that in the same way that well, Silicon Valley and pretty much no one else does, right? That would be my thinking, right? What are those things that we do super well in Australia and where there are real opportunities? And, you know, health is one, obviously, and, you know, some great core view and some great success stories around that space. I think education, developer tools. Let's really focus on those, right? Because we're already seeing some great success there and hopefully we'll see more. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for your time. You're very welcome, Adam. I hope you enjoyed that interview. More interviews are on the way. Follow the podcast wherever you're listening right now. Stay tuned for more interviews with many, many more amazing people from the Australian startup ecosystem. Thanks for listening and see you next time.